Welcome to Disability Life TV. My name is Yvette P. Geeks and I am your host today. And we're going to talk about putting people first. Have you ever stopped to think, do I put people first? And if I did, how would I do that? My next guest is going to tell you how 600 members and 25 chapters right here in the state of Georgia are doing just that. Disability Life TV is sponsored by Connor Dental Associates. This is Yvette Begis and I will be your host today on Disability Life TV. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have with me today Mr. Sherman Bernard Baker. Don't call him Sherman, please. Bernard is enough. In fact, he's more than enough. He's actually quite amazing and I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Bernard Baker and all that he's doing right here in the state of Georgia and beyond. Welcome. Thank you. How are you, Bernard? I'm fine. Excellent, excellent. So tell us about the name Sherman. I just, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> let me explain to you why I don't use it. Okay. That was seven of us, including my dad, my granddad, and my brother. Wow. Uh, but my granddaddy's daddy's name was Sherman. Okay. My daddy's first name is Sherman. My name is Sherman, but my middle name is Bernard. My oldest brother, his na middle name is Sherman. <laughs> so that's why I don't use it. It's about seven or eight of us with that name. So around your house when right. people say Sherman, you we have... We had to ask which one. <laughs> one, two, three, and four, maybe five. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's why I don't use it. I use it only on legal documents. So you're listening. Right. When you see Mr. Baker or Bernard in public and at professional forums, please don't call him Sherman. Is that fair to say? That's fair. Okay. So you started out telling us a little bit about your familial makeup, your sisters, your brothers. Tell us about where you were born and how many sisters and brothers you have. I was born right in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm an old oh. Grady baby. I'm at the I'm what they call an old Grady baby. I have three three brothers and two sisters. Okay. That's by my mom. My dad had outsiders, so it was about nine of us all together. Wow. That's, That's a, a lot of children. Yes. And so, do you like big families? I love big families. You have a family of your own, three? I have a family of three. Girls, boys? I have two girls and one boy. Your baby girl, what's going on with her? Uh, she plays soccer. She does everything she wants to do. She uh, she was playing soccer. Her last game was Saturday. Okay, okay. But she does whatever she needs to do. And she says, Daddy, I want to do this. Daddy, I want to do that. Uh, it got scary at first, but her, like I said, her last game was Saturday. And she got injured at a game, but yeah. she is still up doing what she needs to do. But she's healing fine, right? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about healing a little further as it relates to you, Mr. Baker. You're in a wheelchair. I, yes, I am. I'm in a wheelchair. Your wheelchair is orange. Yes. Mine's pink. Tell us about your wheels. Uh, my wheels get me around and get me to do what I want to do mm -hmm. and what I need to do. So can you walk? No. Okay, so tell us about which disability that you identify with. I have cerebral palsy, and I also have a vision problem in my right eye. I have no vision. Okay. But I don't let my disability stop me. I say you look at a person's capability first, right. and you look at the disability second. That's why he's the president of People First. We'll talk more about that. But it's important to the people watching to those who may not know what cerebral palsy is, to recognize that it's not a birth defect, correct? Yes, cerebral palsy is a birth defect. Well, I'm sorry, it's but, not genetic. Right, it's not genetic. There we go, thank but you. But cerebral palsy affects different people in different ways. Right. I used to have speech impairments when I first grew up as a child. I couldn't speak as well as I speak now. Uh, but I didn't let that stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I went through speech therapy. I did all kind of therapy to get where I am now. And most of all, I have to praise my parents, mm. my mom most of all. Because one thing that she believed in, you got to do what you got to do. Right. And I am a survivor. And, you know, I wasn't supposed to live past the age of five. Wow. And I'm 57 now, headed wow. for 58. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that you can do whatever you want to do if you set your mind to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. I was going to ask you about your parents, but thank you for bringing them up. And also, it's important for you to recognize that while Mr. Baker was born with cerebral palsy, 
Most people call it a disability, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mr. Baker does it. He has children. He has a family. He has a life. And he's making amazing contributions in the state of Georgia. But let's talk about some things we may not know about Mr. Bernard Baker. You share something you don't mind going uh, global? I'm one of the people that helped got the Americans with Disability Act passed. And the way I did that is I joined the group called ADAPT. It was called American Disabled for a Public Transportation at that time. It's now American Disabled for Attendant Care. I'm one of the people that crawled up and down the White House steps. I sit in front of running buses. I crawled on buses to get to help get the Americans with Disability Act passed. Because way back a long time ago, we didn't have lifts on buses so that people could get around and do what they need to do. So, you know, my life has been a chore, but it's been a good chore. Well, I mean, think about the legacy. So, we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Most people call it the ADA. But more importantly, it's only 25 years old. As you heard, Mr. Baker was 25 when they even considered it, at least, at the very least, right? Because he's over 50 years old. But... These are the pioneers and the champions that make it possible for us to access buses and to have elevators and lifts and curb cuts because we're going to find out in just a few moments that those things weren't always available to our guests and what had to happen for them to become available. Tell us some of the situations, just maybe one or two, in which you had to push forward and crawl up the White House steps Tell us about one of those incidents. Well, I'll tell you, in a recent story that got me into it. Okay. There was a friend, and there was a friend of mine, Mark Johnson, that works at the Shepherd's Right. Center. He came to a BYOB luncheon. Uh, at the time, it was called Atlanta Center for Independent Living. Okay. On Moreland Avenue. And he came to me, and he said, you know, I want you to go join this group. I want to take you to a conference. Mm. Uh, me not knowing, I joined this back in 83. So when I went to this conference, as he called it, <laughs> I'm the only person there with suits and ties. Everybody got on jeans, T-shirts, and, you know, just regular shirts, right. regular clothes. Right. So here I am this week in D.C. with suits and ties. Wow. So I'm thinking I'm going to an actual conference where people just sit around and talk. Right. And it didn't work out like that. What really got me involved in it is when I went to, you know, to go into a building, they told me you can't go into that building. Hmm. So I saw everybody else out there chanting, blocking doors, blocking, you know, whatever they needed to block to get in. So when they told me I couldn't get into a building, I'm a firm believer that you can't tell me what I can't do. <laughs> but I'll find a way to do what I got to do. <laughs> so as the police officer came up and told me you can't go into the building, so everybody else was chanting, doing whatever they needed to do, I put my chair in full force. I got out of my chair. And I crawled right between his legs. Wow. And he was trying to stop other people with their chairs. So when he did that, I slid right between him and got into the building. Wow. Uh, you know, because that's one thing that I've always been taught. You don't tell me what I can't do. Wow. I may do it a little bit different than you do, but I do what I got to do. Wow. So what was the impact and what was at the top of those stairs? The impact was, you know, the, it made me realize when I did this, and I looked at Mark and I said, oh, you tricked me this time. He <laughs> said, if I had really told you what you were coming to, you wouldn't have came. That's a good point. Which I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy now that I did. Mm -hmm. And it has, it has really improved my life. You know, because when I was a child, you know, people with disabilities was put in segregated classes. They wasn't, you know, put in mainstream with other people. You know, you got stuck in a class with a whole group of people with disabilities. Wow. Uh, but that changed my life a whole lot, just to know that I had a, I had a voice that I could use. Right. A tool that I could use to help other people. Right. And you have, and I just want to thank you for that, because um, without you, my experience in a wheelchair would have been very different, because it happened decades later. So, I need to understand from you then, what is it in your childhood, in your upbringing, in your mind or your heart, that made you believe that there's nothing I can't do? Well, really what made me believe that was nothing I could do. That was a friend of mine. We always, we stuck together like brothers. 
-hmm. Back in a couple, maybe 10, 20 years ago, maybe longer. Okay. We were, he had a girlfriend and I had a friend. And, you know, we were, we were rolling them back to the Marta station from where I lived in Capitol Homes, which Georgia State train station went that far. Oh, wow. And this okay. lady hit him. She knocked him 50 feet in the air. We both had elected chairs, and she knocked him 50 feet in the air. And when she hit him, that chair folded. Now, you know, elected chairs Whoa, just don't fold. Oh, they don't. That chair folded, and she knocked him 50 feet down the street, and he flipped three times. And he lived about a week later. And he looked at me and he says, when he hit the ground, he says, am I dying? I said, no, you're too stubborn to die. So that's really what got me started into working on getting lifts on buses for people with disabilities and got me into the movement that I'm in. Wow. But Mark also played a big part into that because right. a couple of months after he died, I wouldn't even drive my own chair. Right. I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't do anything. You know, and I had to make up my mind that this... Is what God wanted me to do, and I had to get back into my life. Wow. Uh, but that played a big inspiration part to me. Were and you afraid, though, when your friend Mark died? No. Why, my friend, why didn't you want to? No, my friend name was Willie. Willie Mark I'm Johnson sorry. wanted to help me uh, get back into the movie. Yeah, uh, I was afraid, oh, yeah. cause I'll be honest with you. That lady missed, you know, she missed an uh, inch of getting two for the price of one. Wow. I was just that close to her hitting me, too. But, you know, I know, you know, I am I was put here for a purpose. Right. And, you know, you have to figure out what your purpose is. Right. And once you do that, you do what you got to do. And I love that about you. And Mark Johnson at the Shepherd Center is impacting lives every oh, single he's, day. He's been impacting my life every day. Every single day. I don't look at Mark as a friend now. I look at Mark as a part of the family. That's right. And a part of my family. That's right. And and we'll be talking with him on another episode, but just keep in mind, Shepherd Center is a reason why a lot of us, especially those with brain and spinal cord injuries, can function and, and use our daily lives for purpose, because we all do have a purpose. But before we go any further, I want you to start to think about our next topic, because we ended up on transportation and mm -hmm. about that life-changing incident with the bus. But then there's some microeconomics that are taking place that I'd like to speak about as well. Is that all right with you? That's fine. So we're going to break for our sponsors and advertisers right now. A special thanks to Connor Dental. Please hang out and hold on, and we'll be right back. Connor Dental Associates, full-service dentistry, providing orthodontics, implants, laser dentistry, and general care, set in a calm and relaxing environment. Our experienced dentists and staff are here to maintain your dental health, improve your appearance and quality of life. Compassionate, professional, and informative. Ask about our core whitening system, servicing insured and non-insured patients of all ages. Located in Kennesaw, near I-75. Call today and experience the difference for yourself. Welcome back to Disability Life TV with your host, me, Yvette Pegiste. We also have a special guest today. His name is Bernard Baker. We started out the episode by talking about putting people first. We talked about 600 people in membership and 23 chapters. What does that mean? Well, we have today the president of People First for the entire state of Georgia who can tell you everything you need to know about this organization. So, Mr. Baker... Thank you for joining me today. Tell us about People First. What is it and why should people care? People First is a self-advocacy organization of people with disabilities for people with disabilities. Mm, by us, for us. By us and for us. I like that. I like that. So what's the history of it? When did it start? Uh, people First started in 1991. Okay. It started out with three people. <laughs> One has passed away and one has retired. Okay. I'm one of the, uh, I am the only original family that's still around. Wow. But I was one of those three people. Uh, a lady by the name of Grace Covington Fricks came to me one day and said, how would you like to go with me to the Capitol? Okay. Which, uh, you know, I got introduced to her by a friend of mine, Mark Johnson. Okay. So I went to, with her to a meeting at the Capitol and I actually started uh, working but then it was the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. Okay. Uh, I got paid a thousand dollars a month to help start these chapters around the state of Georgia. Nice. Um, you know, and it started out like I said with three people, but 
then you know one retired and one died. So then I uh, was working with another lady by the name of Tracy Kirkpatrick. Okay. She used to do my paperwork, help me with my paperwork, mm -hmm. and she did the driving. Okay. But now she's no longer doing it, so I'm now stuck in it to you know I'm making sure it keeps running. And people first is my baby because that's one thing that I started. Right. You know, and I'm a firm believer that if you start something, you have to finish it to the end. We have about 600 members, right. but we have different chapters around the state. So you said People First was your baby, right? Yes. And how does your 13-year-old feel about People First being your uh, baby? She, Isn't she your baby? She's my baby girl. Ah. But People First is my baby organization ah, that I started okay. in 1981. We'll clear that up a little so bit. So I know I Baby Girl's going to be watching. I just want to uh, make sure that, you know, your relationship My Baby Girl has now learned a lot about the disability movement. She went to the Civil Rights Museum a couple of months ago. Okay. And she pulled up some friends of mine from uh, Denver Adapt. She pulled up an oh. Adapt Facebook page. And she asked me, Daddy, do you know these people? Wow. And I said, yeah. I said, when you go to the museum, you will see a lot of things about disability rights. Exactly. And you will get to see some of the people that your daddy know, and you'll get to see some of the things that I've done. And that's the Human and Civil Rights Museum. Right. Right here in Atlanta, Georgia. I think it's, what, two or three years old? I think it's about two. Two years old. So... If you haven't visited already, please do. It's not just about civil rights. It's about human rights. It's about right. disability rights. And I like the intersectionality of it all. We don't have to be one thing or the other. We can be a part of many things. We're all fabrics of, of different quilts that was created at different points in our lives. For example, I give a, a lot of credit to the civil rights movement, to the women's rights movements, and to the disability rights movements. I don't have to be one or the other. We can be both. And here's the other thing that's amazing, right? You have done so much within the People First organization, but I'd like you to just explain a little bit about the mission and the vision. What does it mean, People First? The mission is... You look at the pe the person first mm. and the disability last. Mm. Because my thing is, everybody has a hidden talent. Mm. And people now have a chance to use their talent and their gifts. Right. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has a talent. And my thing is to learn people that people say couldn't do it. Right. In other words, you've got people that's in our days in society that don't understand. Right. People have hidden talents. Right. They may not do the same thing that I do. One of the things that I learned a long time ago, because people first has taught me a lot. Right. People may not even, some people may not be able to even speak. Right. But what I've done, what I've learned in the past is I had one gentleman in my group that couldn't, you know, he wouldn't say anything. He'd just come to meetings. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, he lived in Clayton County. Okay. But then he came up and he said, I want a job. I want my own place. I even had a gentleman that, you know, that now works out at Georgia Regional. Right. Uh, people first helped him got his job, helped him got his start. And the way that was because he had a voice. And he wanted to be heard and he wanted to help people with disability. So my main focus is you have to learn about people. You have to learn what the capabilities are. Right. You look at their disability last. But first of all, you have to open the door and have an open mind. Yes. And an open mind, an open frame of mind to realize that everybody has a talent. Right. We may not do the things the way you do it, but right. we get it done. Right. Only if we've given a chance. But isn't it true, as much as each of us have a talent, we also have areas at which we need to work on. So we have a talent and we have limitations. That's what makes us so beautiful and that's what makes us different. And uh, it brings us closer together, really, when we recognize those things and we're open and willing to learn. Now, People First is the name of the organization. But I wanted to bring to your attention that People First is also a process. The yeah. People First process is really important. Did you want me to talk about that, or would you like to? Uh, I'll do it. Okay. One, the way to get a People First chapter started is you have to uh, you have to contact our state office first, either me, I'm the president, but you have to become a charter. Mm. And some, some chapters pay for charters, and some of them do it as volunteer work. So you actually have to become a charter by the state by People First of Georgia. 
And the way you do that is you just call us and, you know, we have chapters that's folded. We have chapters that's still running. But I'm a firm, we are a firm believer that, you know, everybody has a talent. You, we just have to find it. That's right. That's right. I love that because talent is some a lot of times untapped, untouched. And if no one motivates you to find your greatness or to even recognize it, a lot of us are using our greatness but don't realize it. People First is one of those organizations that does don't just help you to put yourself in a position where people are put first and people see you first. But don't you help with like microeconomics and, and jobs and, uh, and all those other great things? We have done several statewide conferences right. in places like Jekyll Island, St. Simon. And one thing that we do is we do a micro enterprise fair every year. Right. And for South Africans, you know, they don't it doesn't cost anything. Right. But we have big organizations like Vocational Rehab and all the other people that want to come in and pay for a table. And out of some of the things that we've done at those micro enterprise fairs, it's helped people got their own jobs. Right. Right. Tell us about your microeconomics, the work that you want to do personally as a business, not necessarily going into work at someone's company, which is fine, but in your case, being an entrepreneur, what is your next step? My next steps and my dream and my goal is to start my own transportation company that's run by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. I've helped other people do what they needed to do. Now, my goal and my dream is to start mine. But also, while I'm starting mine, is I'm not going to forget about people with disabilities. Right. One of my goals is to hire people with disabilities and to give them a chance to show their talents. And that's important, but let's, let's talk about what transportation for people with disabilities, by people with disabilities, will do to the entire community of people with mobility and limited walking concerns. First of all, it will show them that we have a need in our city and in our society. Right. First, second of all, it will show them that we are human beings. Oh, wow. We're not a commodity. Yeah. A lot of people used to go back and think of people with disabilities as a number. Right. I'm not a number. I'm a person with a name right. and with a talent. Right. And, you know, I was put here for a reason. And I go back and I think a whole lot of times about my friend that I was talking about earlier. Right. You know, like I said, she missed the price of two for one. But I still tell people, I'm still here for a purpose. Everybody has a purpose. You just have to give them a chance to use their talent and use their voice. Everybody don't have to be on the front line like I've been. Even people on the back end, writing letters, calling their senators, calling their congressmen, every little bit helps. Right. You right. know, so you never down a person because of their disability or right. uh, their incapabilities. Right. You know, it may help me with somebody making a phone call. Oh, yeah. It may help me get something done with people writing letters. Right. So what I tell people is you look at our capabilities and not our disabilities. I like if that. If you look at the capabilities, you don't have time to worry about the disability. Bingo. And our younger, I like that. And our younger generation now is the ones that I'm working for. Good. Because our younger generation has got to come up behind us and make sure that they don't go through the same problems that I went through and that other people went through. Right. So let me let me just bring something up before we close out. The last time we talked about your transportation business, you mentioned that in all your travels and conferences that you mentioned and going to Washington, D.C., that hotels in particular do not have accessible complimentary travel. So you know how, I'm sorry, transportation. So you know how you travel to all these different hospitals, uh, these different conferences and the hotel has like free shuttle to and from the conference center or to and from the airport well give us the percentage simply just a number of how many hotels actually provide this same service that they make available to all of their you know guests for people with disabilities just give me a number uh zero zero they don't have it zero and that's percent. all over the country all over the country i've been even in you know, as far as they will provide, they have super shuttle that will provide transportation to and from a hotel. 
But once you get there and you want to go to a movie or something with your crew, you know, and I call them temporary able-bodied people. Temporary able-bodied people can step up on a step right. or whatever they need to do. Right. But for a person with a mobility device mm-hmm. or anything, they can't do it. And that's one reason that I'm trying to start my company to explain to people, you know, that we have a chance to get around if we're given the chance. Exactly. And all these other companies are still coming up. Mm -hmm. Like Uber, for one, they don't carry people around with disabilities. That's true. Isn't it against the law? Uber won't allow uh, an accessible vehicle? It is against the law, but the way that I hear Uber's getting away with it, they're using, people are using their private cars. And they really don't want to take the chance on doing what they need to do. So, you're saying to me that based on your experience with Uber, they will not allow you to use an adaptive vehicle with a ramp and tie downs as your work car. Yes, ma'am. I'm telling you that. And they don't even have one in the fleet wow. that I know of. Wow. Are you hearing that? 25 years. We're going into our 26th year. When the law, not the suggestion, was passed for the Americans with Disabilities Act. But that's a whole nother show. I want to thank my guest, Mr. Bernard Baker, for being on the show today and allowing us to recognize that People First is not just a company. It's a value. It's a virtue. And we need to put people first. And here's what's important about People First. People First language means that when you meet someone, not only do you give that individual, whether they're in a wheelchair or otherwise, your complete attention, but when you're talking about a disability like blind person, no, it's person with a visual impairment, right? right? Instead of saying, you know, some other things that I've heard, deaf person and, and some other things, you, you have to put the people part of your sentence structure right. First, so she's a person with a disability, not a disabled person. So I like to bring that up because the comp- the organization's name is People First, but we also need to use People First language when we are dealing with this growing population of people with disabilities. So as we close out, Mr. Baker, we do something called a D Life Diamond. If you have not heard about it, at the end of every single show, where you give me a quick, short, powerful nugget, a jewel. Something you took away from Disability Life TV today and that you can share with our viewers. And what I would like to share with our viewers is you never let anyone take your goal and your dreams. Because once they've taken your goal and your dream, they've taken all your power away. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. (laughs) That's absolutely powerful. Well, you know what else is powerful? The fact that you tune in so regularly and support this program. And we appreciate that because without you, without our viewers, and especially without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to have People First President, Mr. Bernard Baker, on our show. So thank you for watching, and let's tune in again really soon. God bless.